So we're going to talk for a while about the fine-tuning of the universe for life, which is a fascinating topic. Uh, the first thing we need to talk about, of course, are these constants of nature. So what are they? Let's start with an example. Mm-hmm. Okay, Constants of nature are, are vital in, in physics, uh, and they appear everywhere. But we have to understand what they do for us. Mm-hmm. Okay, So let's start with Newton's ideas of gravity. And one of the things you learn in high school, of course, is that when you want to calculate Newton's gravity, what he gave us was an equation, an equation to calculate force. And when you write down the equations, you see F equals. Mm -hmm. On on the other side, you have the two masses of the objects, mass one and mass two, and you multiply them together. You also then divide by the distance apart squared. Mm -hmm. So you have mm over r squared. So you have force equals mm over r squared, Plus, in this equation, you have a capital G. This is Newton's gravitational constant. Mm -hmm. And what that does is it takes the masses and the distance squared, and it converts it into force, which in standard uh, physics is measured in Newtons. Mm -hmm. So we have this number in there, and um, in, in terms of the meters, kilograms, and seconds, that has a value of 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11. And that tells you if you put masses in kilograms and distances in meters, and you plug everything through there, you get a force out the other side, and that force is in newtons. Mm -hmm. And these constants appear everywhere. Anytime you want to relate uh, property one to property two, there's normally a constant in there that converts from one to the other. Right, so one of the places they turn up is in when we try to describe the smallest things in the universe, the fundamental particles. So the language we do that in is called quantum field theory. But what that basically says is the universe really consists of these sort of wavy fields and they have certain properties which are related to the particles that they uh, produce, I guess is one way of putting it. When a, when a field waves a certain way, it will look like a particle. And so it... It's quite straightforward in the equations. You have uh, a term that this this mathematical bit here represents an electron. Okay, so one type of fundamental particle. And attached to that term is a number that's just the mass of an electron. So the equation doesn't tell you what that is. You just, like G in, in, in uh, Newton's equation, you have to go and measure that one. So then there's another term that says, that says, all right, here's the mathematical bit that represents light, that represents the electromagnetic field and its waves. And then there's another term that says, that has a combination of the two, the electron field and the light field. And then there's, an, there's another number on that, which is called the charge, which tells you how strongly uh, electrons interact with electromagnetic fields and so forth. So as you look at the equations, they're just sort of right there, right in front of your face, right? It, this equation won't predict what the mass of an electron is. It won't predict what, how much uh, charge there is on an electron, the way that it, it'll interact. So the properties of the fields, the properties of the way they interact with each other uh, are, are things that the equation itself doesn't uh, predict. Uh, we can go out and measure them, measure them with ex- exceptional precision, but these are fundamental constants because they are just there in this equation. Yeah. I should go back and, and just point out that for Newton's gravity, of course, the equation that you write down, F equals GMM over R squared, you can do a lot with that. You can work out how fast an apple is going to fall. You can mm-hmm. work out how long it's, the moon is going to take to orbit the Earth. You can send a spacecraft to Pluto. Mm-hmm. But you can only do that once you know what that value of G is. Mm-hmm. And um, it was the uh, physicist Cavendish who set up this experiment. Essentially, he took masses, he put them certain distances apart Mm -hmm. and worked out what she is. And once you've got that number, you can make accurate predictions. But as you said, you can only measure it from nature. You can only ask nature how big is G or the charge on the electron or the mass on the electron, etc. Nothing in our theory tells us what those values are, Mm. right? So they thought to be fundamental and you have to ask nature about them. Right, so is there just this fixed once and for all list of fundamental constants or do they change, it, so to speak? It, it, well, it varies actually. It's kind, of, it's kind of interesting that as theory advances, often the number of these fundamental constants goes down because your new theory, if it unites concepts, mm-hmm. unites these uh, um, 
con concepts unites these constants. Yes. So <laughs> there's a bit of a mouthful. As an example of this, the famous one is to do uh, with James Clark Maxwell's work in the 1800s. So before Maxwell, there'd been a whole host of experiments that have been done looking at electricity and electric fields over here, magnetism and magnetic fields mm -hmm. over here. Okay, they looked like they were quite separate things, but you know, lots of experiments done by people like Faraday showed that if you mess around with electricity, you can produce magnetic fields and vice versa. And what um, uh, what Maxwell did is he could write down a single set of equations that spoke about electricity and magnetism together. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism. Now, when you dealt with electricity and, and magnetism separately, there was a constant associated with each. One that told you how to work with charges and distances to get electric fields, and the other than how you worked with basically currents mm. and how that gives you magnetic fields. If you're going to unite all those together into a single set of equations, then those two constants get united together. And one of the great successes of Maxwell, he showed that a, um, a combination of the permeability of free space and the permittivity of free space, these two constants, can be united together and they become one as the speed of light. So the speed of light is the natural sort of unit or the constant that appears in Maxwell's equations. And of course, that tells us how fast electromagnetic waves propagate. So in advancing theories, the number of uh, these constants tends to go down. But as, as you know, as our observations and understanding of the universe gets better, then we need to introduce new constants. And one of the famous ones, of course, was introduced by Max Planck when he uncovered the world of the quantum. Mm. He needed a new number to describe the scale of things going on, and that is that little h, Planck's constant, and that appears everywhere when you deal with quantum mechanical effects. So that then the numbers go back up again. Yeah, so particle physics in particular is was... Uh, responsible for a kind of explosion of these as we discovered new types of particle I know there's there's debates you know they have to try and work out which ones of these are fundamental which one of these are the bottom which one of these are sort of built out of it but as you know the explosion of new particle discoveries in the 60s and 70s dies down and we start to get a standard model we start to get a picture of what are the real fundamental bits of the universe we start to boil down to, all right, these are the standard bits, these are the fundamental pieces, and so their properties are then the fundamental constants of the standard model. And as we boiled it down, there are now about 25. That's where we're sitting at at the moment. So the very, there are you know, various types of quarks, for example. There are uh, six different types of quarks, and they've all got a mass. And so there's six fundamental particles because we don't know how to calculate those masses from scratch. There's obviously uh, different ways that the fundamental forces interact. These particles interact via those forces, and there's a whole heap of numbers to describe those. And so when, at the end of the day, when you write down all the things you need, you, you end up with these sort of 25 leftover constants. Um, mm -hmm. If you ask a particle physicist, they'll sometimes say 26. That's because they claim the cosmological constant is theirs, but we're cosmologists, so we're saying that one's ours. Yeah. We'll talk about that one later. Yeah. But at the end of, end of the day, if you're a physicist, you stand back, you say, okay, this, this standard model is explaining a whole heap of stuff about uh, our universe, how things are put together, the sort of stuff that happens when you smash stuff together in particle accelerators. But 25 is still an awful lot of leftover bits. Mm -hmm. And so what we would really like is some way of getting that number to go back down again. And this is this notion that um, if we can push our theories forward, then maybe we'll find that the the, the mass of the electron and Planck's constant are not independent. Mm. They depend upon something else and they will be combined together. And of course, the great dream is to come up with a theory of everything of which there's no freedom. Mm. We don't have to ask nature anything, that all of our mathematics predicts everything including these fundamental constants but some people think that's a pipe dream more than something that's physically going to happen in the universe well this was einstein's great dream uh so he, he wondered whether there was some theory that was so tightly put together that there's just no loose dials that you can yeah. dial up the theories we have like you know uh, newton's theory of gravity that number g you can change yes right there's nothing that tells you what it is. But this was Einstein's great dream. And it's been a siren call for physicists ever since, <laughs> some to their doom, unfortunately. If Because this, these numbers are by definition something that the current theory, current best theory we have doesn't predict, if you can come up with a theory 
that predicts what these numbers are and you get that prediction right, necessarily you're doing better than the best that we have. And so Eddington in particular spent a lot of the last, uh, Arthur Eddington spent a lot of the last sort of decades really of his career trying to understand one particular theory, one particular constant, which is called the fine structure constant. Yes. It, it, uh, its value is roughly one over 137. Yes. And so he spent an awful lot of time racking his brain to try and come up with some way in which the number 137 could come out of some deep symmetry, some ge- geometric idea, some some idea that would pop out with 137 and then you'd know what this number is. Yeah. So one of the interesting things about the fine structure constant, of course, is unlike capital G, mm. uh, now G depends upon what um, mm. units you're using, right? So if you're using kilograms and meters, then you get a certain value of G. If you're using pounds and furlongs, you have a different value of G. Yeah. But you can combine these constants together to make dimensionless constants and alpha the fine structure constant is one of these one over 137 and the first measurements looked like it was exactly one over 137 which is where oh, actually it was one over 136 ah. do you know this story no 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 so so it, it was originally thought to be exactly one over 136 and so eddington sort of directed all of his numerological efforts at one over 136 and then a better explanation a uh, better sorry measurement showed it's one over 137 and so now he has to go back and 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 uh, he, some wag called him Arthur adding one so he had to try and add one but now now 137 is the magic number you have to aim for and as we know now it's not exactly 137 it's at 137.05 something yeah, something yeah. something something so it's not quite a whole number but he's not the the only person that's worried about why one over roughly 137, the great Richard Feynman mm. had a quote that, you know, this is something that all physicists should wonder about. Why one over 137? And what he meant by that, of course, is that what would the universe be like if it wasn't one over 137? What if it was one over 100 or one over one or one over a thousand or one over a million? Is there something special about 137? Well, you can play that game with all these other constants. We could write an entire book, in fact, about uh, what would happen if all these fundamental constants of nature had been different. Yes, I think that's something we'll have to get back to. Absolutely.